Welcome to Philosophy 4. We're continuing to talk about the empiricist philosophers. The next philosopher to cover is George Berkeley. Berkeley lived from 1685 to 1753, and he was an Irish philosopher. He was also an empiricist, which as we know means that he was committed to the idea that everything we know, all ideas we have in our mind, and the limits of human knowledge are all defined by what we gain from experience. Now this position drives Bishop Berkeley into being an idealist philosopher. Berkeley's most famous statement is, to exist is to be perceived. This makes him an idealist. An idealist philosopher is someone who believes that ideas are the only real things. What does it mean to say that ideas are the only real things? Think about something like a ball. A ball has a certain color, texture, shape, sound. Most of the time we think about these properties as being properties of some ball that's out there separate from our perception. But Berkeley wants to say the only real concept we have of what a ball could be is actually just a bundle of ball-like perceptions and that's all a ball really could be for me. Berkeley in fact sees his idealism as being a stronger example of empiricism than the empiricism of John Locke. You remember that Locke said, all objects are made out of mind-independent substances, but we can never know those substances. We can know properties of substances, but all those properties inhere in some substance, and we never have direct access to that substance, only to the properties of the substance. So Berkeley accuses Locke of believing in something that he can't actually observe. If you can't observe it, why do you believe in it? And for idealists, there is no such thing as a substance to external objects. External objects are defined by the perceptions we have of them, and they have no external existence in some kind of a physical essence. You will also remember that Locke divided the properties of objects into primary and secondary qualities. All qualities of objects, he said, do exist as mental qualities. They're qualities of our perception. But some of those, like shape and motion and penetrability, these belong to objects in themselves, separate from our perception as well. But Berkeley says if all of these properties exist as we perceive them, as perceptions within the mind anyway, then why believe that some of them exist beyond that in some substance that we can't observe? Why not just say that all there is to objects is the sum of perceptions that they generate for perceivers? So here's that worldview as John Locke had it. Secondary qualities are only in perceivers. Primary qualities are in perceivers, but also describe objects. Berkeley says, well, just move all of this over here and redefine what we mean by the world, not as the external world, but as the sum total of things that are perceived by perceivers. Now, Berkeley also wants to solve those skeptical problems that we saw Locke trying to deal with in his own way. You remember that at one point in his skeptical doubt, it seemed like Descartes could say, I could have my experience of the world even if the world were not out there. Maybe the world, in fact, does not exist. When Descartes says, well, I know that the fire and my chair by the fire exist in my mind, and I know that I exist, I think therefore I am, but how can I be certain that the world really is the way I perceive it to be? Bishop Berkeley's answer to this question is just going to be to say, well, if by world you mean some external thing that exists outside of perception, we have no evidence of that anyway, but you have direct access in your mind to that chair and that fire. There is no gap between the mind or the world of perception and the world as it exists outside of perception, because things just are perceptions. You remember that Hume had said, we never observe causes or laws of nature in the world directly, so why do we believe in them? And Bishop Berkeley is going to say, yes, Hume, you're right. We do never observe causes or laws of nature, that necessary connection in the world, and so we shouldn't believe in it. Objects just are bundles of perceptions and ideas, and perceptions and ideas can't cause anything. 
you remember that Hobbes believed because there are laws of nature, humans can't really be free. Just like billiard balls are causing these effects on each other in these deterministic ways that have no variation, the way we explain something like the raising of my hand has to do with the physical laws of my neurochemistry transmitting signals through my arm and to my hand. Thus, the ideas like human freedom or human choice or the idea that we could have done otherwise should be rejected. But Berkeley will say, if you accept my perspective, causation in objects is itself unreal, and so there's no reason to think that objects can control us. Berkeley spends quite a bit of time in the reading talking about and responding to objections to his view. He knows that some people will consider it to be radical and unbelievable, even though to him it's just a matter of common sense. So we have someone object to his theory by saying, so Barclay, you're telling me that objects are not real. Barclay says, no, I'm not saying objects are not real. In fact, I think that all we ever could have really meant by object is just an object of perception, because all objects as we know them exist only in perception, and there's no way to think of any object except in the way that we would perceive it. A classic objection to Barclay's point of view is the idea that if objects are nothing but perception and to exist is to be perceived, then what happens to an object when I'm no longer perceiving it? If I'm alone in a forest and I look at a tree, the tree exists because the tree is an object of perception. But what about when I turn around and walk away? Does the object just cease to exist? Now in his early view, Barclay seemed to be okay with this idea. And just to say, yes, why would you think a tree is there when no one is perceiving it? But in his later view, expressed in the reading, Barclay has another solution to this problem. Bishop Barclay is a bishop in the Anglican Church, and he's a firm believer in God. And God ends up tying up all of the loose ends here for Barclay. So Barclay says, well, God has infinite perception. All things are in God's perception. Therefore, even if I stop thinking about the tree, because God is still perceiving it, the tree will still exist. Barclay is also very happy that his view gives God a central causal role to the universe, because literally, if God were not there, the universe would cease to exist when God stopped thinking about it. So what about laws of nature and science? Does this mean that those are false? Barclay says, no, there really are regularities and laws in nature, but they just describe the kind of thoughts or experiences we will have. They're not facts that exist outside of experience. Barclay also says that the laws of nature just describe the regularities and how God conceives of the world. And because God is an orderly being, God thinks of the world in orderly ways. But this does not mean for Barclay that laws of nature can have no exceptions. God can allow us to have free will, and God can allow the world to progress in any way he pleases. This also shows how Barclay is going to answer another objection. If all objects are just ideas, why can't I make the world however I want it to be? Why can't I just decide to fly or imagine a pile of gold, and suddenly that gold will be real? And the answer is just that for Barclay, God's infinite mind sustains and orders the world, and that's outside of my direct control. 